from his tough on by gangs over the past few decades. But this approach also alarms others as reintroducing authoritarian rule into a country that has a long history of military dictatorships. Today we're going to be in conversation about El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, and the history of authoritarianism in El Salvador that resulted in a brutal civil war in the 1980s. My guest for this is Hector Lindo Fuentes. Hector Lindo Fuente is a professor emeritus of history at Fordham University. He is the author of many books about Central America. His latest in English is called Modernizing Minds in El Salvador, Education Reform and the Cold War, 1960 to 1980. He's written a few books in Spanish since his latest called Il Alborador de Central America, Troublemaker in Central America. Hector Lindo Fuentes, it is my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's for me an honor really to be in this conversation. Well, we appreciate being able to have conversations and talk about the history behind important news that is happening at this moment. And at this moment, last week, again, El Salvador overwhelmingly uh, elected Nayib Bukele uh, to a second term as president. As I said in my introduction, um, El Salvador's constitution explicitly states that no president can serve consecutive terms, yet he did, and it wasn't by achieving, and you will correct my under, understanding if I'm off on this, but it was my, my, my understanding is he, it, it wasn't constitutional changes that were made. They didn't make a constitutional amendment. What he did was he stepped down six months before uh, the election occurred, and hence that allowed him to run again. They basically found a loophole. Is that a correct understanding of what happened? Well, it's a it's a manufactured loophole in a way because the constitution has six different articles that prohibit re-election, and he managed to uh, appoint a new group of judges in the Supreme Court that passed a ruling that, if you read it, it, it it's not even internally logical, but it gives him a fig leaf to run for re-election. But but it's a it's a ruling that every constitutional expert in in El Salvador and, and internationally really uh, recognizes as as fraudulent. And uh, the, the constitution is uh, repetitive in prohibiting the the re-election, and the history of constitutions in El Salvador is also very emphatic in in rejecting uh, the possibility of re-election because of bad experiences in the 19th century and the 20th century. There were historically very many uh, rulers in El Salvador who sought to stay in power for as long as possible. And uh, that's the reason why the constitutional documents, uh, when written, uh, tend to emphasize the, the prohibition for re-election and also put obstacles uh, to reforming the constitution to avoid re-elections. So there's a very long and deep history of, on the one hand, rulers who want to stay in power, and on the other hand, uh, a constitutions that try to block them from, from doing so. Nayib Bukele is a young president, first elected to his first term when he was, I think, around 37 years of age. Uh, he's now in his early 40s, uh, charismatic. He uses social media uh, a, a lot. It, it's oftentimes talked about El Salvador and his popularity is because his tough on gangs and tough on crime approach. Do you think that's accurate? Uh, that has led to his popularity in El Salvador? Yeah, that's accurate. Uh, it is also related to his enormous ability to uh, to shape the conversation uh, through social media. His uh, his communications team is is very skillful and also has enormous amounts of resources. I mean, they they put a, a great priority into uh, dominating the conversation and making sure that everybody talks about. Uh, the, the issue of the gangs. It is also true that he, when he came to power, the traditional political parties uh, had lost a lot of legitimacy, in part because of their uh, 
inability to deal with the problem of the gangs. So the contrast was very big. And also the, the corruption that was revealed in, in administrations of uh, both former right-wing governments and left-wing governments. So there was a, a tremendous disenchantment. The point I'm trying to make is that he is feeling a political vacuum. And through his uh, skillful use of social media, particularly, he has uh, inundated the the airwaves and 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 the space really with uh, with his version of what happens in El Salvador at every moment. Before he he was mayor of San Salvador, and and he comes out of the FMLN party, the the exactly. leftist. Well, he started uh, as a, as an advertiser. His his family had an advertising agency that uh, ran the campaigns for the left. His father had uh, deep links with the left. So, as a young man, he worked in the political campaigns of the left. Then he became mayor of a small town, and after that, he decided to jump to San Salvador, still aligned with the uh, FMLN. The the left-wing party that is really uh, an offshoot of the guerrilla movement of the 1980s. He is also of Palestinian descent. Is that unusual to, to find people in El Salvador with Palestinian descent? Well, uh, in percentage terms, is is not a big segment of the population, but it's a very visible segment of the population because when they arrived to El Salvador in the uh, late nineteenth century, beginning late nineteenth uh, century, beginning of the twentieth century, during the dissolution of the uh, Ottoman Empire, many people people came from Palestine. They uh, engaged in in commerce, and they had certain advantages. They had uh, links, they had uh, relatives abroad, and they could engage in international trade, and they were very successful. They were also very discriminated against. Uh, uh, some of the authoritarian governments passed legislation trying to stop them. So there is uh, a history of economic success and also uh, a history of discrimination against them from the part of the traditional uh, coffee planter agri agro export elite in, in the country. And coffee is, is an important part of, of this history. Coffee is a very important part of this history because uh, in the 20th century was the main uh, export of El Salvador. And uh, the elite of El Salvador is very much linked to the growth of coffee exports since the 19th century. And, and that's how they uh, consolidated their position in power and, and use it in in a very effective way. And also thought about the government in a patrimonial way, uh, as if it were a, a coffee plantation, so to speak. I mean, it, it, they thought about uh, exercising power in the same way as they thought about uh, managing a plantation with uh, with indigenous workers that they could uh, lord over. We're going to get into this history deeply in, in just a moment, but one more question about this, I think to help set us up to get into this history, uh, that's more about what's happening today and really over the past few decades. I, I, I have, you know, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have many people from El Salvador who, who live around here. I, I know many folks from El Salvador. And this is just anecdotal, but many of my friends have told me that ever since the brutal civil war of the 1980s in El Salvador, El Salvador has never been the same. And it's important to understand uh, this current moment in the past few decades in gang activity, and the you know, United States plays a role in this, a big one, um, but with this gang activity, it's important to understand the civil war. Do, do you agree with that, that El Salvador was devastated by this war and had never recovered? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, but th there's another element to that. The end of the war was marked by peace accords, uh, which were a grand compromise between uh, the two sides that were fighting this very brutal war. And uh, the peace accords tried to... Uh, chart uh, a sense of direction for the country, trying to consolidate institutions, 
it, that would permit a more democratic form of government, uh, guarantee independence of the three branches of the state, freedom of the press, uh, greater respect for human rights. So in that sense, there is also a, a change of direction in, in the country. Uh, the experience with the gangs comes parallel to that. But the two, there are two tracks to this post-war period. Now, on the one hand, changes in the political institutions that up to a point were, uh, were making progress, not rapid progress, but some progress. But at the same time, the uh, experience with the gangs getting more and more uh, brutal and uh, creating havoc in people's daily lives. And the United States is important in this. I mean, one of the more noticeable gangs that we'll all recognize is MS-13. This is a gang that begins in Los Angeles, I believe. That's correct, yes. Yes, and it has a lot to do with both the war and U.S. policies. During the war, many people left the country because the country was uh, very difficult to live in. Not only the violence, but also the, the, the economy was doing very poorly. Uh, people had to migrate from one part of the country to, to another just to save their lives. And, and a very important wave of migration to the United States began at that time. So many Salvadorans uh, went to the States, many to the West Coast, and many young kids found themselves in the street of Los Angeles, uh, very vulnerable. They were uh, low in the totem pole of the hierarchies of the, of the barrio, of the, of the poor neighborhoods. They were looked down by the uh, Mexican gangs and partly as a defensive move, uh, Salvadoran gangs began to emerge. And one of the ways for them to defend themselves and to assert uh, their presence in, in this brutal, brutal world of, of, of gangs was being even more cruel than the previous gangs. And so they developed a very violent culture. And many of them ended up in jail, and the jails were... Uh, were a university of violent behavior and uh, of gang behavior. And then, because of internal political pressures in the U.S., uh, hostility towards migrants and people without uh, proper documentation, uh, many of these uh, kids who have learned how to be criminals and how to be violent and how to be cruel to other people were sent to El Salvador but, but at the beginning of the Clinton administration that was already happening and they go to a country that has been devastated by war a country that is in serious uh, economic trouble and without the kind of uh, social protections and, uh, and programs that could have uh, done something about it and there are many uh, other kids in El Salvador, young people who were very vulnerable, who were unemployed, who didn't have much of an opportunity during the war. And during the post-war period, they were trying to find what to do. And they were uh, very attractive for these gang members who were already organized in Los Angeles, who already had developed certain habits and had connections too with uh, with, with the father gangs or mother gangs in, in Los Angeles. So they were very successful organizing within El Salvador in that atmosphere of post-war El Salvador. So they, the problem grew very rapidly and the governments were not prepared to deal with that. And, and, and many times they thought they could be instrumentalized for political purposes. They could be used for uh, political campaigns so there were deals made between uh, politicians in El Salvador with, and, and, and members of the gangs, which made it even more dangerous. And the rhetoric that was used to deal with them was similar to the rhetoric that was developed during the war, kind of uh, with a strong hand, 
using uh, the coercive power of the state, we're going to control this problem. It was not seen as a social problem that required long-term planning, that required very deep thinking about how to address the issues of young people within El Salvador and, and, this, and find programs to, uh, to help these, these kids who were being uh, deported from the U.S. So the combination of this culture of gangs imported from L.A. and a country that had suffered tremendous dislocations due to migrations, due, due to the economic decline during the war, that was an explosive combination. I, I just think the story of El Salvador is really important for everyone to kind of grasp and think about. And I, I say this because, and it is my belief, and you'll find this anywhere around the world, it, 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 this, happen, this will happen anywhere, and that is if people are living in a chaotic situation uh, that's dangerous, in the end, what they want is a return back to normalcy. In an end, they will popularly support a strong-armed authoritarian to come in and try to restore order just to make life normal again. What happened after World War I happened in Germany and in Italy after World War I, the, the dislocations, the economic decline, the, the lack of sense of purpose after the war uh, created a breeding ground for authoritarian figures that offered an iron fist uh, a, an easy way to deal with the problem and the quote-unquote good people would not be affected by that. It was only the quote-unquote bad people, the ones who would be repressed. Of course, it's a terrible bargain. It's We're talking about bargain. like Franco and, and Mussolini. and Exactly. Yeah. It, and it's something that in the end empowers uh, the most negative impulses of powerful people. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Hector Lindo Fuentes, Professor Emeritus of History at Fordham University. He's the author of many books about Central America. His latest is called The Troublemaker in Central America. It's published in Spanish. Uh, we are talking about the history of El Salvador and why this history matters to the current situation today. Let's, let's now dive into this deep 100-year-plus history of El Salvador. Obviously, you can always go farther back, but at some point, we got to cut it off. Uh, in 1931, we get a military coup, and there would be military rule for the next several decades in El Salvador. But with the coup, they overthrew... Uh, a democratically elected reformist president, Arturo Arajo. Um, before we get to the overthrow of Arajo, what is El Salvador like in the 1920s? What's important to know about the 1920s in El Salvador? Well, it's, it's a country where the main export is coffee. And uh, the elite, the oligarchy, really is a uh, is a, a group of coffee planters, people who defend in the prosperity of their business and their ability to recruit labor for uh, for the coffee season. And this is a, a, a country where uh, the political tradition had never been democratic. As a matter of fact, the dictator who came to power in 1931 was already a seasoned politician. He had been uh, rising in the ranks of the army during a period in the 1910s and 1920s when a single family held power. This is His, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez? Yeah, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. His political career and his military career was during the time of the so-called dynasty of the Melendez Quinones family. And it gives you a sense of what a people with power did with the constitution of the time. They respected uh, elections in a way, or at least the, the limits in the period in power, because they found a trick. They first, the first president of the family passed the presidency to his brother. And then uh, when there was an interim period, they passed the presidency to their brother-in-law. And then the brother-in-law became president. 
So, and that's the environment in which Hernandez Martinez uh, matured politically. And, and he was an instrument of that. He was, uh, he was a powerful military man. And many of the policies that he's going to implement in the 1930s had already started in the 1920s. So he doesn't come from nothing. He comes from a political culture that valued uh, a sense of hierarchy and disrespected the Constitution. But when he comes to power uh, in, in 1931, uh, the Great Depression was in full force yeah. and had had enormous impact on El Salvador. I mean, El Salvador exports coffee. Coffee is not an essential product. People in Europe, people in the United States were trying to uh, be careful about how they use their family budget and coffee was not first priority. The point is coffee exports suffered dramatically. There was tremendous unemployment. There was an explosive situation in the countryside. So at the beginning of 1932, just a couple of months after he came to power, there was uh, an uprising in the western part of the country. The main area where coffee uh, was produced, and uh, coffee was produced in land that used to belong to the Indian communities. The indigenous communities traditionally had communal land based on uh, the Spanish colonial legal traditions. But for coffee production to, to grow rapidly, they decided that it was necessary for all that land to become private, to be a commodity, to be a good collateral for credits to increase the production and to plant more trees. The end result was that many in the indigenous communities in the West lost their lands many times through uh, fraudulent means. So there was a tremendous discontent. And then during the Great Depression, there was a significant amount of communist agitation in the area. So there was an uprising in 1932. And this military man who grew up in this uh, authoritarian system finds in that an opportunity, starts uh, a brutal repression of the uprising. But I, when I mean brutal, is uh, we're talking about people uh, massacred by the thousands. About uh, between ten and thirty thousand people were killed in a matter of weeks by the government. All branded communists, Indian communists, because they, they conflated both uh, both terms and both categories. And uh, he took the personality, the political personality of the fighter against communism. He saved the country. He saved the oligarchy against communism. And that was his way of consolidating power. That allowed him to do whatever he wanted with the Constitution from then on, to suspend constitutional guarantees, to be reelected, and uh, to repress anybody. Because if you complained against him, if his very substantial system of spies decided that you were uh, an enemy of the government, you could be labeled as a communist, and that was enough. So this creation of the internal enemy, it starts in El Salvador before the Cold War. The origins of this virulent anti-communism in El Salvador starts in the 1930s. And uh, if you allow me to uh, draw comparisons, I see some parallel between how Bukele is consolidating his power by finding an internal enemy. Now the internal enemy is the gangs. And anybody who opposes Bukele is labeled as a friend of the gangs. And, and if you look at Twitter, for example, People who criticize the government are instantly attacked by, by the trolls, by the people who work for the government, really, uh, as being friends of the gangs. Whatever criticism, you could criticize uh, the problem of the debt. Well, you criticize that the debt is growing, but that means that you're a friend of the gangs. Yeah, a, a common 
usage and, and, and power to, to label anyone who's critical as either friend of the gangs or friend of terrorists or friends of, of communists. Right. Uh, tell, I'm, I'm going to skip around a little bit here because I, I, I did want to actually ask you about what happened in 2020 uh, when Bukele was trying to get one of his measures through, through, uh, through El Salvador's Congress or legislature and at the time, he did not have a majority. I believe he, his party now, he does have now a majority, but at the time he did not. So he comes to the legislature and brings the military with him and also angry well, supporters. It, it, it was incredible. Uh, uh, first of all, he convened the legislature to meet, but uh, it's not the prerogative of the president to, to convene the legislature. There, there, there are rules for that, and that's the prerogative of... Uh, the co-equal branch of power, the legislature. And he goes with the army, which was something that was seen as uh, a thing of the past, because the peace accords that I mentioned uh, included elements of uh, removing the army from uh, internal politics, because that was seen as one of the big problems in the past the participation of the army in politics. And uh, civilian police had been created in order to uh, give the responsibility of internal order to the civilian police and keep the army in, in its barracks uh, just to deal with external threats. So just the very fact that he brought the army as an ally was a substantial break with the order that had been established uh, with the peace accords and also the, the agreement from the part of the army to, to play that role uh, signified a, a very important shift in how things were doing. So immediately people got uh, extremely concerned about what was going on and what was in the mind of this man. And he goes into the, into the chambers surrounded by the army, really uh, intimidating the the legislators who were there, the, the, the Congress people, they, they, they're called diputados. And since he could not force a vote, and he didn't have the votes, he goes to the podium and then he puts his uh, head on his hands and starts praying, looking for the inspiration of God, because God has told him that he has to rule. So he, he, he starts to uh, create this messianic image of the envoy of God who is going to liberate the country from, from the gangs because the, the, legislation, the legislation that he was trying to, uh, to get passed by intimidating people was uh, to fund a project that he said that he had to deal with the gangs. So it, it, this is uh, one of these... Uh, key moments in the presidency of Bukele, one of the early key moments that indicated that he was willing to break with the order that had been established by, by the peace accords. And, and this happens in February of 2020. February of 2020, exactly. We just had the anniversary of that. It was uh, February 9th. And as I'm reading this, I couldn't help but think about what happened in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, which actually happened after happens almost a year later. This happened in El Salvador first. And at that time, uh, Trump was still uh, the president of the United States. So his ambassador, uh, Ronald Johnson was his name, uh, was uh, not scandalized by what happened. On the contrary, he had become kind of a, an informal advisor to Bukele. And apparently he's still uh, in communication and kind of a bridge between uh, the Trump faction of the Republican Party and President Bukele. Bukele, who was supposed to have been uh, of the left, of the FMLN, but now is very strongly allied with people with connections with uh, with Donald Trump and his allies. So El Salvador would have 
uninterrupted military rule from 1932 to 1979. This begins the rule with General Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. He rules for about 12 years, and then you have, I guess, successive military rulers after that. During this period between 1932 and 1979, there are some uprisings, especially strikes. Yeah, there, there was a significant amount of discontent, and it, it is not a completely uniform period in terms of the degree of uh, dictatorship. There were moments of certain liberalization that created some hope that there could be a transition to a, to a more democratic system. In, the, in 1972, there was a pivotal election. Since the 60s, uh, there had been a, a relative liberalization in, in in the political discourse and even the capacity of political participation. And a Christian Democratic Party had emerged. This is a time when the Christian democracy was a big movement uh, in South America and in Europe. And there were elections in 1972. And by all accounts, the candidate of the Christian Democrats won. And uh, there were people within the army that would have been willing to accept that. And that could have been a transition to, uh, to a more democratic form of government and uh, alternability in power. But the uh, economic elite and the more conservative members of the army, and apparently also uh, the American administration decided that that was not possible, that even though uh, the opposition had won and a civilian government uh, should come to power, uh, there was uh, a change in the counting of the votes in the very last minute. There was a blackout and votes were recounted and all of a sudden the candidate of the army won. And after that, you see an increase in radicalization. Many people who say, well, we tried to play by the rules. We thought there was a liberalization. We thought it would be possible to introduce changes uh, peacefully. But the government is, willing, is not willing to uh, allow us to participate. So it, there is a... a, a closing of the possibilities of introducing political and economic change through peaceful means that was felt very strongly in the 1970s. This is the decade when you have uh, increased guerrilla activity and also right-wing uh, death squads attacking uh, people perceived as enemies from the left. So political violence increases in the 1970s is this uh closing of the political space and the realization or or the assumption by, by many people not necessarily from the left just people who had democratic inclination saying well there's no way out there's no way to uh, introduce changes in the economy and in the uh political system outside of violence. So they, it spiraled down from 1972 to 1979. Is it in this period that we get the rise of the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, the FMLN, the leftist guerrillas? That's correct. There was a, a, a number of different groups from the left. And uh, by the end of this period, they decide uh, in order to have a chance, we have to unite our forces. And uh, the Farabundo Martí Liberation uh, Front, is, it was really a coalition of groups who had separate identities. And they kept it up to a point. Even today, you talk to people who were members of the FMLN, and they say, yeah, but I was from the Bloque, or I was from the Fuerzas Populares. They, they kept some of the, uh, their identity from the past. So the Farabundo Marti Liberation Front was a coalition of, of groups of the left, in, including the Communist Party. 
It's interesting because I, I did want to ask the role of indigenous people in the FMLN. You mentioned earlier that there is a history of indigenous resistance to what's happening in El Salvador since in the late 20s, uh, early 30s, they're the ones who would lose the land to the coffee plantations. Yeah, although it's interesting that during the civil war of the 1980s, most of the activity was not in the western part of the country. As a matter of fact, uh, it was a relatively quiet part of the country. Most of uh, the activity was in the east and the north of the country. And yes, the, the, the memories of 1932 were very strong. Well, all the uh, names in, from the 1980s war came from uh, the 1932 events. Parabundo Martí was... Uh, executed as being one of the leaders of the 1932 events. Some of the death squads uh, took the name of people who had been active in 1932. The, the most important right-wing death squads was called Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez death squad. And uh, during the 70s, during this period of polarization that I'm talking about, the memory of 1932 was very strong. Every time that uh, the conservatives, the oligarchy felt threatened, they would bring mem back memories of 1932 and would say, well, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez knew what to do and we could do it again. And doing it again meant, well, we could just unleash the forces and, uh, and kill thousands of people in, in a matter of weeks. That's what they really meant. And also the memory of the legendary fighters of 1932 uh, was kept alive. And much of the history was written at that time, and some of the more popular history books uh, were related to that period. It's very interesting. Uh, Farabundo Marti is, is a person, again, the 1930s. This is where the FMLN gets their name, Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. I couldn't help but think of the parallel to, to the Zapatistas in, in Chiapas, uh, naming themselves after Emiliano Zapata. Exactly. I would find a, an iconic uh, name. And uh, it was a very compelling character as well because he had fought uh, alongside Sandino in Nicaragua as an anti-imperialist. So he had this... Uh, two sides to his biography, having fought against uh, the American Marines in Nicaragua and having fought against Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez in El Salvador. But he was executed in 1932. So uh, that contributed to his legend. There was no further political career, uh, possible mistakes or whatever. He died uh, in the heat of the battle so to speak, while well, he was executed, but uh, immediately uh, after the events. And but, again, the, the right-wing groups using the name Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez, this is the guy who conducted the coup and became leader in the early 1930s, his, his, his name being used by uh, right-wing death squads. H how is Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez remembered today in El Salvador? Well, that's a very interesting question. Even today, there are many people who remember his period as a period of peace, a period when there was no corruption, a period when uh, the, the national debt was kept under control. There is a whole mythology around him. As a matter of fact, I spent uh, a significant amount of my career trying to dispel the myths around Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez. But it was an easy myth to create because he controlled the media, which is exactly what Bukele is doing. He owned a newspaper. Uh, his censorship of the newspapers uh, was uh, complete. So uh, he fabricated this image of a super honest individual who was able to keep the national debt under control. At that time, the, the the national debt was a big thing because in the 1920s, the politicians have left the country under tremendous debt, which had an impact on the national sovereignty of the country. Uh, the country was uh, pretty much under the control, at least the economic policies, of American banks. 
because the debt was so high that the American banks uh, were able to get the government to accept the appointment of an American official who was in control of the revenue coming to the country through customs. So government expenditure was decided by an American. So there was an abridgment of sovereignty that was the result of the national uh, of uh, of the this enormous debt in the, of the 1920s. So Martinez uh, portrayed himself as the one who stopped this indebtedness of the country. Of course, that's a full myth because the reason why he couldn't get more debt for the country is because because of the Great Depression, El Salvador could not get more debt. It was just a bad country to give credit to. Nobody wanted to lend money to El Salvador. Not only that, the American guy who intervened in, in the customs collections was one of his main economic advisors. So there was no such thing as great uh, economic sovereignty or anything like that. That, that's all a fabrication. But uh, the reason why I elaborate on this is because it tells me how important this complete control of the narrative that Bukele is developing, how that could have long lasting effects unless uh, people uh, make serious efforts to uh, set the record straight. Now, one thing that I would like to point out, if you allow me to, is that there's one big difference between the previous authoritarian uh, episodes in El Salvador. And that is that one of the things that the peace accords were able to, uh, to create or, or, or that was created in the context of the peace accords was an independent media which is now playing a very important role. And I would say that Salvadoran journalism is going through a golden age. There was uh, there are journalists who are doing first-rate investigations and covering corruption, uh, risking their lives, really, to, uh, to set the record straight. Many of them are in exile already, but uh, their, their role is is extremely valuable now and and they seem to to be willing to keep playing it they don't seem to be intimidated you look at what's being uh, produced today uh, about the counting of the votes after this uh, election that gives you hope that they will continue working and they they say so i mean if you talk to them and say well yes this is what we do we can spend an entire show just on the Civil War of, of the 1980s, but I want to ask about U.S. involvement in this whole history that we've talked about with our limited time available. And I say this because I remember I was a kid in the 1980s. The situation in El Salvador grabbed the attention of of the United States in, in popular media. Uh, I remember the movie Salvador um, uh, yeah. by Oliver Stone. Uh, there was the movie, I think it's more in the 90s, Mi Familia, in which one of the main characters is a refugee from El Salvador. Uh, in the 80s, in the mid-80s, my very first protest I ever attended, I, my aunt took me to San Francisco to protest U.S. policy in El Salvador. Um, what What is the U.S. role, not just in the 1980s, we know that, and just put it out there, uh, many people for the, uh, for, for the military and others would train at the School of Americas here in the United States, but through this whole history, sort of through the 19, maybe 1920s on, does the United States play a, a role through this thread of history that we've been talking about today? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the book that you mentioned uh, as my last book is, is about the beginnings of this uh, transformation of U.S. policy in Central America. After the opening of the Panama Canal, really since uh, the Spanish-American War, U.S. gave tremendous importance to Central America because of the proximity to the Caribbean and the Panama Canal, and which uh, 
was a, the greatest strategic asset for the United States. So it was very important to have compliant countries in Central America. And uh, I mentioned this family that was in control uh, for for 12 years. And, and you mentioned uh, a pseudo-democratic country, a regime that was uh, replaced by uh, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez in 1931. Well, the reason why that happened is because the last of member of the dynasty wanted to reelect himself. But El Salvador was uh, part of a series of treaties signed in 1923 that uh, in order to keep Central America peaceful for the purposes of the Panama Canal included a prohibition of recognition of any government that came to power through extra constitutional means. So when this last member of the dynasty, whose name was Alfonso Quiñones Molina, wanted to be reelected and had gone really far into the reelection process, uh, the U.S. government told him this is not going to be tolerated. And immediately he changed his tune because the United States was concerned not about El Salvador or the constitutional order, but about stability in Central America for its proximity to the Panama Canal. However, in and that's why this a democratic guy was elected in, in 1931. When uh, Maximiliano Hernandez Martinez got reelected by playing games with the Constitution again in 1939, and it's a little bit of a complicated story, the day after his fraudulent reelection, the American ambassador gave him a big dinner party. The day after, it was just because uh, the United States was at that time worried about. Uh, the proximity of World War II, Europe was very complicated. Uh, the good neighbor policy was taking shape. So the United States was not in the business of uh, di disturbing authoritarian regimes in Central America anymore. And the same was happening with Somoza in, in Nicaragua, with Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. The point I'm making is uh, the policy towards El Salvador has a lot to do with the larger view of the strategic interest of the United States. In the 1980s, Ronald Reagan decided that after what had happened in Nicaragua with the fall of the dictator Somoza in 1979, uh, the United States was going to draw a line in the sand to the Soviet Union in Central America. What had happened in Nicaragua was seen as a, as a grand plan of the Cold War and the United States, in a full Cold War mentality, decided, OK, this is it. We are not going to allow something similar to happen in El Salvador. So started sending a lot of resources to the Salvadoran army, which felt empowered. And uh, their right in El Salvador felt empowered. And that helps to explain, in part, the in numerous human rights violations because they felt free to settle scores in every possible way because the United States was going to be on their side. You had Ronald Reagan speaking wonders about the Salvadoran government. You had uh, Alexander Haig talking about law, uh, lines on the sand. And you had Jean Kirkpatrick saying that uh, some of the uh, victims of the of the death squads, like a, a group of American nuns that were killed by the army in uh, in those years, that they were really left wing activists. So there was this justification for some of the worst excesses and, and lots of resources, about four billion dollars were spent in El Salvador at that time because it was seen as as part of the Cold War confrontation with the Soviet Union. Hector Lindo Fuentes has been our guest. Hector Lindo Fuentes is Professor Emeritus of History at Fordham University. 
He's the author of a number of books. His latest in English is called Modernizing Minds in El Salvador, Education Reform in the Cold War, 1960 to 1980. But his most recent book is written in Spanish. The English translation is The Troublemaker in Central America. He has joined us to talk about the history of El Salvador. Hector Lindo Fuentes, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you very much. I only want to make one clarification is that the book Modernizing Minds, I co-wrote it with Eric Ching, a very esteemed colleague, and I don't want his left his name to be left out. Good. Eric Ching, co-written with. Thank you again. Thank you. Morning, Susan. Kiki Palmer? Breakfast? HelloFresh has free breakfast.